with you. When Jesus went in with his disciples to take that last supper, he said uh, that he had desired to take this, have this supper with them. And that's the same way I feel about having this memorial feast uh, for Christians with you all today. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a full moon out there, so if you just happen to go crazy and run around the place, I'm just going to keep on preaching, okay? I'm just not going to pay any attention to that. We love having our visitors today, and we have a bumper crop today. You know, that's what I live for. I live to be able to see some new faces because, to me, that is reaching into the community and finding those that need the Lord at some juncture, whether they be teachers already equipped to pass down the word to others or whether they be people seeking the Lord. I love to see it. Uh, this morning, I want to remind you all of a very basic teaching of Jesus Christ, and it's found in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, this when I call it basic, it, it's because when you have opened up your Bible and you have found the New Testament, you will find in the first few chapters of the first book in the New Testament, Matthew, the Gospel according to Matthew, you will find just there at the end of chapter 4, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. So you don't have to go very far to see how Jesus started preaching and teaching to the people. Uh, Jesus tackles the concept of good people in a bad and a deteriorating world. You see, that still works for us today. There are good people and the world is deteriorating. The two concepts that he uses to convey this principle are salt and light. When I studied this section of scripture, I'm reminded so much of the passing trucks on the road that have salt life on the back. Have you seen those? It's, it just reminds me, I'll, I'll, I already go to the teaching in Matthew chapter 5 where he talks about, you know, you are the salt of the earth and you are, you are the light. And I, I want to somehow take that logo that's becoming so popular and Christianize it, you know. And so I haven't... I haven't perfected that. There's no t-shirts for sale today. I haven't really done anything. But still in my mind, that it, it reminds me of that passage. Now, to go back into where that came from, Salt Life, I wanted to tell you the original story of how that all got started. Because it's very commercial. But to me, it's got a spiritual message, and I'd love to use it. The Salt Life brand was created in 2003 by four men who were, weren't just friends. They were also avid watermen from the Jacksonville Beach, Florida area. Drawn by their shared passion for the ocean-centric activities, they embarked on a journey to develop a brand that wasn't just a logo. They wanted it to represent a style of life. And that's what I like about it. It talks about life, not just one object to buy. The Salt Life brand strives to effortlessly combine function and fashion with an incredible fit tailored for the active lifestyle. With its relentless dedication to provide gear and designs that transcend, it has successfully evolved into a lifestyle brand with worldwide appeal. And I do see it a lot of places. Every time I go down the road and I see a nice looking truck, or sometimes on the cars, I'll see that, that uh, Salt Life brand on there. Well, whether it's surfing, fishing, diving, or simply enjoying a day at the beach, those who live and breathe the Salt Life have one thing in common, the ocean and all it has to offer. So I look at the concept of somebody surrounding the ocean. I love salt water too. I mean, come on. I, I love fishing. I love boating. I, I love salt water better than I like fresh water because the fish are bigger. I mean, that's right. I mean, you hope you catch a big one. I do. I catch the little ones, even in salt. And, and in Tampa Bay, I catch nothing. Nothing. I fish all day. It cost me a fortune to fill that, that boat with, with gas go out there, get the bait, buy those little shrimps and little chunks of uh, sushi and put it on the end of a hook and put it in the water. It costs a fortune. I usually come back with nothing, but I, I love it. I love it anyway. I, I do prefer my beach time, however, at my age and, and my experience in life in the shade. Anybody else like that? When you go to the beach, I got a big umbrella. I'm trying to be protected. You know what's strange? I have boats and I have a fishing equipment. I have bathing suits. I have all kinds of things to do with the ocean, but I don't have a Salt Life logo on my truck. <laughs> I'm amazed at the dedication and the public display of those who embrace the ocean and all it has to offer. So as I go to the Bible today and I begin to read about salt from the Lord's own mouth, 
I do not even compare to the ocean lovers with my public displays of my faith in Jesus. They don't compare. Salt life, salt light is life. I tell you that if you don't get anything out of today's lesson, I already have. I've already, I've already taken a, a great lesson from just that much so far. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now, you know, I think he could have just went, said you're the salt of the earth and maybe explained that a little further. But he went negative on us right after he tells us how great we are, what, what flavor we are to the earth. But then he, then he warns us. So let's, let's break this down. Let me interrupt the reading of the scripture of those, the two concepts, salt and light. So, and to say that the salt that the Lord is referring to here is you and I. It's a metaphorical term. It's a, it's a term that, that is uh, referring to a physical property and putting it on us, comparing it to us as, as followers of him. You've probably heard about the properties of salt before in several sermons, right? You guys know all about salt. So let me remind you of a few things because I'm not going to inform you. I'm just going to remind you of what you already know. Salt tastes good. Do I hear an amen? Ruthie, you were my amen. Okay. I, I used to have some amen people that if I said something significant, they would amen me. So thank you, Ruthie, for being here today. I've missed you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And you know, when I went to, just a little sideline here, can't take too much time because Fred will tap his watch. But uh, in, in a long, three years ago when I went to Havendale to try out for that sermon, uh, Ruthie was in the audience, and I looked out there, and I said, you know, the church that I come from, I was the amen guy. Whatever the preacher said, amen, brother. You've got to preach on, brother. Rock on. And, and I said, when I left that church, I, I'm sure it's not going to be the same. So I said, I need somebody in this audience. And guess who raised her hand? Ruthie. So I'll do that. So, I, so we had a deal. I would point to her. She'd go, amen. You know, she'd stand up and shout and do something crazy. And, and, I, and I missed that. That's it. That's it. It's not bashful. So salt tastes good. I was always told, and I, I have a, a, for those of you who don't know, my wife is a, is a science professor. She's, she's a very scientific girl. She teaches high school now at an adult high school in uh, Tampa. But she's been middle school, and she, her, her major in college, her degree is in biology. So she knows a lot of things about science. So once in a while when I'm tripping over the internet trying to get information for this stuff, I'll come across something and I'll go, hey, dear, what do you think about this? So I did it. I said, hey, are you familiar with the tongue map, the map of the tongue where you actually taste salt? So as I was looking up at the area of the, they said both sides of the tongue is where you taste salt. But then this guy, this science said, we debunked that myth that you can taste salt anywhere on your tongue that there are receptors all over. So I'm into the science of this thing, and I don't want to get too over anybody's head, especially my own, when to talk about the science part of things. But I did take it to my daughter, who's in college studying education, and she's been the, 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 the ultimate student of the science teacher her whole life. And they both were going, yeah, there's a map. Yeah, you got a sweets on the tip. And da, da, da. And I'm going, well, they, they said it's wrong. What? She said, what? That's not, that can't be right. Where'd you hear that? You know everything on the internet is true, right? right. Yeah, right. Yeah. No. So I had to give her a couple of sources. It wasn't just one going to work on that. But yeah, that's true. That they that 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 is one of the things that they have come up with, experimented. That's the old school thought process. Is there's a map on the tongue? But uh, so I didn't I didn't want to burst anybody's bubble about what you might know about you know the body and the parts and the, the tongue. But um, salt tastes good. It tastes good on wherever part of the tongue it falls. It tastes good. I like salt in my food. So any of you guys got high blood pressure? Yeah. Man, I know everybody, right? So salt's not so good for us, right? So we have to like get salt, light salt or, or none, very, very little sparingly, right? Yeah, sea salt, all kinds of different things. Well, so um, one some Sunday morning years ago, it's kind of a funny story. So if you don't laugh, I'm going to get my feelings hurt. I'm leaving. <laughs> I was in a I was in a little church, much smaller than this one. We and and 
there was a Bible study time, and I was the Bible teacher. This is many years ago. And as I was doing it, we, we generally had donuts and coffee, like we have, we have it here, Don donuts right out there. And um, so I was just sitting there without a cup of coffee, and this fellow, who was uh, mentally challenged, but he was an older man, and he was quite the, he, he was a very encouraging. He would come to every single time. He'd ride his bicycle from home. He lived about five miles away. He'd come in, and um, he, would, he would offer to help me anyway. So this morning he said, Pastor Allen, can I get you a cup of coffee? I said, thank you, Bill. I'll take, I'll take that cup of coffee. Thank you. He says, how do you like it? I said, well, I like it black with a little bit, of, little bit of sugar. At that time, before I found out I was diabetic, I could actually have sugar. Now I have to go Splenda or some, you know, some, something else that will kill me in some other way. But at that time, I was doing sugar. So he, he went back and he got it, he handed it to me, and I'm teaching away. And all of a sudden, I'm just sitting in a chair with my legs crossed. And I, I took a swig, and I'm all over the floor. He had put a spoonful of salt in our small churches. Have you ever had coffee with a big teaspoon of salt in it? Oh, oh. And, and, and then I wasn't expecting it, so it just, I made a mess. And Bill was so apologetic, and he never did that again. I don't drink coffee in church anymore. And when I'm teaching a lesson, I leave that alone. No, it was, it, was, it was a simple mistake he made. Look, we had sugar in one jar, a mason jar. You, you guys have mason jars around? Yeah. Maybe, maybe on camping you take. And you take salt, it looks just like sugar. <laughs> just white. Instead of, and so he, I about, I about had a seizure at that point. But, uh, <laughs> we, we got through it and I made quite a mess. It usually tastes good, but it doesn't taste good on everything. So I guess I wanted to make that point. Salt does not taste good in everything. So in the coffee that morning, it didn't. Now, sodium chloride, chloride, a.k.a. salt, did you know that it's essential for human life? We have a lady friend of ours who just recently, she's in her 80s, she just recently ended up in the hospital uh, because she well, it was uh, not enough salt in her diet. Some pills she was taking was actually eating the salt out of her system, and she ended up in ICU for weeks. <coughs> So you actually need to have salt, folks, to, to live. I'm not a nurse, but the, that's what the girl said that was in ICU. That was the condition that she had. The doc, sometimes doctors give us all kinds of medicines, and one goes to war with another, right? Mm -hmm. Or some of our things. Disagree. So it, it's essential for human life. Until the invention of canning and refrigeration, salt was the primary method of preservation of food. It preserves not surprisingly, it has long been considered valuable. Have you ever heard the saying, he's not worth his salt, or she is worth her salt? Yes. Well, I, you know, I, I like to go back and find out where things come from. So that actually nobody knows, but they think it came back from the Roman era, which would have been the first, second, third century, somewhere in there, where the <laughs> Roman soldiers would get a paycheck, but part of their, their uh, allowance the government would give them salt instead of their paycheck, um, and that was for their food, to preserve their food, because that was essential for them to keep up their strength and keep their, keep their soldiering uh, good. So that's, that's uh, if you're worth the salt, it's just, it's around. It's in our speech, it's very common. Um, another thing about the teaching of Jesus on this subject of salt is that he went negative after he said, you're the salt of the earth. So, okay, so we're the flavor of, of our world. We, the Christians, the followers of Christ, are the flavor of our, we give life flavor. And also, we're pr preserving. We're preserving a good life. We're just preserving the way God intended for life to be led. So we're like salt in that. But then Jesus went and said, that if it loses its saltiness. Well, what, what is he talking about there? Maybe you've heard this before. And again, some of you old hats that have been around a while, you've heard all kinds of sermons on this particular subject. But maybe there's one or two that haven't heard this yet. That in the Middle East, there were places like the Dead Sea where it would dry up on shore and they, they would mine salt. There was sea salt galore right there. It was very pure and that was good. But as you went up the hill or went into other areas, the salt would mix with dirt and then the sun would come out and further deteriorate that salt and it would mix in with the, uh, the rain would dilute it as it came down. So once it's exposed to the elements 
and it's exposed to dirt, the ground, it becomes unsalty. It loses its ability. You might as well take a little scoop of dirt and put it in your coffee and see if that tastes good. Because it's not going to do any good. It's not going to preserve. It's not going to flavor anything. And that's what Jesus was talking about. He said when they would come across that salt that had been so mixed and so diluted and polluted by the ground and by the rain and by the sun that they couldn't just throw that anywhere if it lost its saltiness. If you threw it in your garden, it would kill the plant still. There was enough poison in it that wasn't good for the soil. So they would throw it on the roads where they didn't care if grass grew. They didn't care if a stalk of corn came up. So that's when he talks about that that bad salt would be trampled under the feet of men. So now you know everything. Now that, now that that is explained, perhaps the teaching about being useless and trampled underfoot makes more sense. Now to interpret this teaching of salt, Jesus is telling those in his hearing that godly believers are a benefit to society. Amen. 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 There, we lost our signal. My, I lost power in the finger there. It didn't work anymore. Yes. Next, the warning as to life without Christianity has no flavor. It's, it's not good without Christianity, without the, the life with God. Next, the warning to the believers, that's you and I again, because we're the salt, is to be careful to stay pure. Because as salt is no good when polluted by the dirt and the sun and the rain, we as Christians can be polluted by the world around us and the dirt of the world. And we know what's dirty. We know it's dirty and filth. We know what is polluting. And if we mix with that, guess what? We've, we've done what Jesus said. We've become worthless salt, unsalty. As salt needs to be pure and protected from the elements, so do we as believers need to stay pure and free from the worldly lifestyles. He continues in verse 14 of chapter 5. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. If salt is the brother, then light is the sister in our lesson today for our Christian witness. Do you remember being in a Sunday school class as a child and pointing your index finger up and singing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Where do you think that comes from? That comes from this scripture right here. That's exactly, see the simple things in life sometimes are the most meaningful, the most adorable, the, the most, the deepest are the ones that are right there for us to see. There was a famous pastor one year that was asked to give the definition of the deepest Christian theological statement that he could come up with. And he thought for a second, he said, I've got it. And they all, all these pastoral students were all sitting there waiting for this doctorate in, in theology to speak. He said, Jesus loves me, this I know. You know, we, we pass up some of the, the most basic teaching as, ah, you know, that's for kids, that's not for us. Let me look into to who's, when Christ is going to come back and how many, you know, beasts and how many this and all. Let me really get spiritual. Let me look into Daniel and, and all. And not that you shouldn't do that because blessed are those that read the books, the, the words of the book of this prophecy. Yes, however, let's don't miss the big picture. Jesus loves me this I know. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Don't let Satan get out. I'm going to let it shine. You see that? The trampling under the foot. Don't let Satan influence and pollute us. It's all in that little song, that sweet little song from way back. Shine all over the neighborhood. Go ye into all the world, preaching the gospel baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Shine all over the neighborhood the gospel message. Jesus is alive. 
shine all over the whole wide world. Look, that, that has emissions in, in that. That has, not only do we have a mission to go to our neighbor, but we have as best we can as we grow and get more money and more ability and more people that want to, we go overseas. And we go into lands where maybe it's a lot more difficult to preach the gospel. Although I have to say from my perspective, it's pretty difficult right in Valrico to preach the gospel, depending on who you are and where you are. There's, there's some big churches around that are doing a fine job. I'm just a little guy, and, and we are just a, a little group. But I am, I am thinking that there is room in the hearts of some that this is exactly what they need. They need an intimate gathering of people to come to know that Christ is Lord, that he came to save them from their sins. So what is the message of this song? That we are visible to those around us. That we stand out in a crowd. We're salt, we're light. I was working in Lakeland building a tire kingdom many years ago. I supervised all the trades for a big general. I am a general contractor, but he was the boss. I was working salary for him to get the job done as quickly as possible. So as I'm working on there, and I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor part-time, and this is my full-time gig. So I'm working out of town, and as I'm working, one of the subs comes up to me one day, just was watching me do my thing. Hey, you, you know, don't forget to put an outlet over there, and don't forget, hey, who's paint, painter? You're going a little slow. I need you to go a little faster. Chop, chop. As he was watching me do the superintendent thing, he noticed something different about me. I didn't have foul language. I wasn't cussing everybody out as they came out the door. Every other word wasn't some foul thing that just in the course of conversation, like, like I hear on many jobs, uh, that's not how I spoke. I didn't, I didn't go up to him and say, hey, I don't like hearing that word. I'm a preacher and you better stop. I don't do that. I, I don't do it. If it's, if it's in my ear and it's right next to me, I might. <laughs> I might do that. But as a general rule, uh, my light shines because of the way I behave. And I try not to pick on people or belittle people because they don't know yet. But I'm hoping they're watching. Well, this one guy was watching. He gets me in the office. He says, hey, Alan, there's something different about you. I said, well, uh, okay. What do you, what, what's the problem? He says, no problem. He says, you don't have a foul mouth. He said, are you a Christian? I said, as a matter of fact, I am. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm a preacher down in this little old hick town in Wachula. And, uh, and I'm, I'm proud to, to be named as a, as a minister of the gospel and a Christian. And uh, he said, so am I. He said, and I recognized you from the crowd here. And you didn't say one time, hey, what about Jesus? Did you want to hear the story of Jesus? Not one time did I beat him over the head with a Bible. Not that that's wrong. Because I've been known to do that too. I was called thumper on another job. <laughs> Bible thumper, you know, but thumping the Bible. You know. the mechanic told me one time, man, he cussed me and used Jesus in that, and I was offended. And I went off in my in my uh, shop by myself, and for a while, and I said, man, that's it. I, I don't want lightning to strike me here with this guy <laughs> blaspheming right in front of me. I got to get out of here. So, so you know, he he learned a lesson there. And he came over to apologize. He knew that Jesus is important to me, even though in his world, he's not. So there was a difference, and I, I don't know how that all works out. I know we do plant seeds in our life. <clears throat> you know, on that job in Lakeland, my boss was a Catholic, and it was so funny, when he, when he found out he was, he was hiring a minister who was also able to do uh, construction work or, or supervise the job for him, he used to confess to me once in a while, and I said, man, I'm, I'm not that kind of guy. I'm not that guy. I'm not that priest guy. But I said, I'll, I'll listen to you. But, you know, right now our relationship is, you know, I'm a Christian. You know, I'll invite you to church, and, and uh, I'll be glad to sit down and have a Bible study with you. But in the course of a day, when, when I'm on the clock, I'm, I'm trying to serve you in the way that you've hired me to serve you. So if you want me to be your priest, I will. But he had. I guess, I guess and, and one time I had to write daily reports. So in those reports, I had to put in there, if the job was delayed for a certain reason, I had to put in there what it was delayed for. Uh, and so this particular day, or a few days, it was raining. It was mush. Have you ever been on a construction site where the mud got all muddy and like even the trucks can't, you know, it's all been uh, worked up with the machinery, the excavation and stuff. And so the clay and the stuff is all kind of loose. So rain just messes things up. You can't even drive on the site. Well, I put on there, uh, the reason for the delay, God sent some rain. 
<laughs> and I sent it in with my report. Okay, well, he knows I'm a pastor. What? So, But you know, all the other supers are putting in, I don't know what they put in. I don't know, I couldn't do it because I didn't have this or this guy didn't show up. So I, I, I put it where it was, it rained. You know, I, I blame God, I guess. I didn't mean to blame God, I just explained it. So one day we, I was in the office and he was talking to me about things and he says, you know, I read those reports. <laughs> what he meant was, what are, you, what are you doing putting God in my reports? Are you, are you religiousizing my reports? Salt, light, it, t it tastes good. Now, he was kind of tongue, tongue, he wasn't really rebuking me, saying, don't you put God in any more of my construction reports. He was just letting me know that he was watching. And I think he really appreciated it above all the others. And he might have even got a chuckle out of it. Well, to make the spiritual connection, I have a lot of work to do to convince people that do not know Jesus that he lives and that he wants them to live now and for eternity. People of the world living without God are in the dark. They have no life, not really. The man who dies with the most toys wins nothing. He wins nothing. That's, if the gain is life and being born with a silver spoon in your mouth and gaining all possessions and then one day, like the rich man in the Bible, you, you just die. You're, you're done. I'm going to store up for myself these things. Well, today your life is required of you. Your soul is required of you. Here's the challenge of today's lesson. I think that some of you, if not all of you, will respond to me that I'm a little nuts. And you're probably right. I can handle that. Perhaps I am a little crazy, but I want to put a sign up in this church on this property that is, is capable of speaking to the passerbys, whoever might come up and down this road. I know somebody's watching because as I put my signs out there, they're stolen about as quick as I put them up there. So I know somebody's watching and paying attention. I found a sign that is capable of sending a digital message 24-7. It's full color. It's a digital thing. I started salivating as I looked at the possibilities. I missed my sign at Havendale Christian Church where I would change the message once a week. It was the highlight of my week is to go up there and evangelize with a static board and a few letters. And I would put up the most controversial things to make the biggest atheist and, and, and the biggest heathen stand up and think, wait, if that's right, ooh, I better look at myself. I'm about to ask myself that question. One time on the sign... I got famous. They didn't know it was me. They knew Havendale Christian Church. It got in Christianity Today. Are you familiar with that magazine? Well, it's a big magazine, I guess. Somebody going down the road saw that I had taken from the Eagles song, Desperado. I had taken the first line. Um, now, no, what is the first line? Um, oh, boy, memory. I, I hate losing memory. I, what is it about AIDS that burns memory cells? Uh... Doesn't matter what it is. Somebody took a picture of it and sent it into the magazine, Havendale Christian Church, um, Desperado, why don't you uh, come, to come to your senses? Why don't you come to your senses? We'll put it on, okay, well, that, that could be a secular message. It could be a spiritual. It was a spiritual message because it was on a Christian church sign. So the, the guy took a picture of it, sent it into Christianity Today, and they were doing this article on crazy church signs. And we made the cut. <laughs> We were on there. We were pictured there. Yeah. Havendale Christian Church. Why? You know, Desperado. And, and the guy said, you know, this is a stupid sign. <clears throat> he was really throwing me under the bus. He said, uh, if the Eagles aren't coming to, to lead the worship there, that, then the Eagles are the, the group, the, the music group. They're, they're secular. If they're not leading the worship that night, this guy's false advertising. Well, as a matter of fact, we started having karaoke Sunday night in there, and we did sing Desperado in the church that Sunday night and called people from the community to come in. Do you see what I'm getting at? People are paying attention. I would like to get a sign that's going to cost some money, and I'm going to just challenge our little church to start some sort of an account, savings account, or some rich guy, go ahead and write a check. It's going to cost about $4,600 for two sides. I know it seems like a lot of money. But I know that if we are witnessing to those out there, some poor person who is out of light, who's, who knows they're in the dark, and there's a lot of folks going through a lot of things these days. They're, they're losing their jobs. Oh, yes. they're, they're losing their, their children. They are losing, and they're losing their health. There's a lot of people in a very dark place 
that are looking for some meaning in their life. And we've got it here with the scripture. We've got it with our fellowship. We've got it with the teaching because we can't teach fast enough the things that need to be taught from the Lord's, from red letter stuff in the Bible. We just can't get it fast enough. So I would love to have a sign out there that will just scroll messages, tell of events of the church, and show even pictures of maybe some times in the church when somebody took a little video clip and just get it into the eyes of the world so we can truly be a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. So we can truly be a light to our community. So we can truly get the message where they don't have to come in here and knock on our door. Thank you very much for coming. <coughs> but so they don't have to do that. They can still get something that they know is from the Lord. That's in our heart, isn't it? I hope that's why we've come together, not only for our own selves, for the fellowship, for prayer, breaking of bread, and the apostles' doctrine, as it says in, uh, in Acts chapter two, chapter 2, but also for those with, that, with the great commission. The mission of the church is to reach those, to reach those that are lost. Jesus' mission was to reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Our mission is to, to reach all the rest of them that are lost. And we can't rest until we accomplish our mission. And we hear from the Lord's lips, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Are you looking forward to that time when we'll be face to face with the Lord? Because right now, it's just a temporary thing. It's important for us to be here, but it's a temporary thing. We're not going to be around forever. Poor little Emma might not be around, but a, a little while longer. And there are, there are older people like Lillian. We don't know what her days are, and, and all of us are in between all that. You may think you have a lot of time left in your life, but you do not know. Nobody knows. And then we can always hope the Lord will come back and shorten it. Come on back right now. I'm ready. Right now. Are you ready? I don't know if you're ready or not. The invitation is yours today. If there's something that you need for us to pray for you, if there's somebody that's not a Christian in here, we'd like to take your confession. I'd baptize you right here on this floor, but there's not enough water to fill the place. So we'll figure that out uh, as the time comes. We'd love to add you to the roles of the church and get busy trying to find other folks that are not saved.